The format wasn't a surprise, so you got what you expected. OK. Hard, easy. Nobody ever wants to say that. Fair. Hard, OK. Fair. Fair? Yeah. Fair. Fair is good. Fair, I always like to hear. So thank you. That's, that makes me feel uh, better, certainly. So um, other th OK, good. So highlights were a good strategy for you. Depth of knowledge wasn't too bad. Did you uh, have issues with time? A little bit of issues with time, OK. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you that one of the, the things that I wrestle with in exams, and this class it's usually not a problem, but uh, in my other uh, 450 class it sometimes is, um, is um, wrestling with length. And I'll tell you why it's, why it's tough. Um, I don't want you to be rushed for time. So I don't think that you do your best work if you're rushed for what you're doing. But, and that's a, and, and that's a, a big consideration here, but the fewer questions I ask, the more each one's worth. Yeah. And nobody likes that. And so it's kind of a question, well, should I have more or fewer? And at the last minute on this one, I decided to make, uh, I, I put in an extra long question so that it wouldn't, the ones that I had there wouldn't be too stifling in terms of numbers of points. So that was why that one is a little bit longer than my usual uh, first exam is. It's usually the first exam is about the only exam in this class where anybody has any issues with time. And that's because people tend to spend a little bit more time on calculations than they need to. Or I shouldn't say need to, but then there, it takes them longer to do calculations. That's, maybe that's a better way to put it. Okay. So um, I'm always open to feedback. Um, I think that the only way that exams get better is if you give good feedback, what you like and what you don't like. I think both, both go, and I think both are important. And um, I do appreciate your feedback. So um, let me know what works and what doesn't. Okay. All right, so uh, <clears throat> the uh, material I want to talk about today is I'm going to finish up enzyme controls, and then we will talk about membranes. Okay, so um, that's uh, the plan. Last time I got into some mechanism, and I talked about mechanisms by which uh, chymotrypsin uh, acted, and I pointed out to you that all serine proteases work in a very similar fashion. So I'm just going to very, very briefly review for you what I said last time, and then we'll uh, move forward. So I pointed out that serine proteases all have, and there are many serine proteases. There's probably 20 of them, OK? They all have the same general active site. And that active site of this enzyme contains three important side chains of amino acids. The three side chains that we see in the active site of serine proteases are aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. That's the serine that gives them their name. Okay. I pointed out that in the mechanism of the serine proteases, oops, not what I wanted there, that in the mechanism of the serine proteases, That's not what I wanted either. There we go. The one that says reaction mechanism. It's kind of hard to read. All right, bad joke. In the mechanism of these serine proteases, it's the binding of the proper substrate and only the proper substrate that causes these slight shape changes that bring about catalysis. If the wrong substrate binds, okay, let's say I've got the wrong amino acid in there that's part of a protein, nothing's going to happen. Only when the right one binds is there a slight shape change, and that slight shape change, which is really hard to say fast, that slight shape change is what brings about the overall cat catalysis. That catalysis, you may recall, involved moving these three amino acids closer to each other. The movement of the amino acids closer to each other caused electrons to shift. And the result of that electron shift was that a proton was taken off of serine. That left a very reactive ion that we call the alkoxide ion. The alkoxide ion is reactive, and it attacks the carbon of the peptide bond. Now, that resulted in the peptide bond being broken. 
So where we had one polypeptide chain, now we have two. One is free, doesn't go in, it just gets released, is all that happens to it. Bang, that happens very quickly. So we've gone through the first fast step of the process. Okay? Uh, you don't need to worry whether it's amino or carboxyl, so just one half of it is gone. Okay? And then that second half becomes covalently attached to that serine. That's a transient bond, and that bond gets broken slowly by water diffusing into the active site. Okay? So that's the overall mechanism, and that's what these figures are trying to show you. It's what I'm trying to tell you in words. But in summary, there's a fast step and there's a slow step. The fast step is the breaking. The, the slow step is the releasing of the second polypeptide chain. Okay. That's basically what's up with them. Now, as I said when I described that to you, this mechanism that we see with serine proteases, and all the serine proteases are almost identical, very similar things happen in other proteases. So that's one of the things I want to show you before I move on. All right? So there are other proteases that have very similar mechanisms of reaction. And one, or, one group is called cysteine proteases. Okay? This shows the active site of a cysteine protease. This protease is known as papain, P-A-P-A-I-N. It comes from papaya fruit. Okay? And its mechanism is almost identical. I'm going I'm to say it to you in words again so that you can see what's up with this. By the way, as I said, you're not going to have to do any artwork and draw these things out, but I do think that you should be able to describe a mechanism in terms of what's happening. What are the steps that's happening in this process? I think those are reasonable things. Okay? A cysteine protease uses a mechanism very similar to a serine protease. In a cysteine protease, we have two important amino acids. One amino acid is cysteine, which gives it its name, and the other is our friend histidine, again. So we've got cysteine and we've got histidine, both of which play very important roles in the catalytic action. Well, what happens in the cysteine protease? When the proper substrate binds, again, it always takes the proper substrate. When the proper substrate binds, we get a slight change in shape of the enzyme. This causes the cysteine to get close to the electrons in the histidine ring. And guess what happens? Histidine pulls off a proton, leaving it behind a reactive sulfur, which is what you see right here. That's a sulfur with a negative charge, just like we had an oxygen with a negative charge. Okay? And that reactive sulfur acts just like that reactive oxygen did. It attacks the carbon of the peptide bond. And exactly the same thing happens. We see one half is released. Okay? The other half is covalently attached. And that covalent attachment is a, is a slow step of the process. The very first release of the first one happens rapidly. The slow step happens because water has to come in and release the second half from the cysteine. Almost identical mechanism. We have two amino acids instead of three. But very, very similar things are going on. Okay? So cysteine proteases have a mechanism very much like the serine proteases do. The difference being that we have a SH side chain instead of having an OH side chain. In this case, what you see is the H has been pulled off already by the time you see this. Yes, sir? It's not called an alkoxide because that would be a, uh, an alkoxide we refer to the oxygen. So, yeah. If you want to call it a sulfoxide, you can, but that's not uh, what we're going to call it. I just call it a, a negatively charged sulfur. Technically, it's not a sulfoxide anyway. So, okay. Um, other questions about that? All right. Well, it's appropriate at that time we have a song. There's a song I have that summarizes all that. So let's sing a song, and then we'll move on to other stuff. An early song today. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. All serine proteases work almost identically using amino acid. Try as catalytically. First they bind peptide substrates, holding onto them so tight, changing their structure when they get them in the S1 site. Then there are electron shifts at the active site. 
Serine gives up its proton as the reaction goes on. Next, the alkoxide ion, being so electron rich, grabs peptides, carbonyl group, breaks its bond without a hitch. So one piece is bound to it, the other gets set free. Water has to act next to, let the final fragment loose. Then it's back where it started, waiting for a peptide chain that it can bind itself to. Go and start all over again. All right. Okay, so that was our serine proteases. The last thing I want to say um, on this, uh, uh, this section regarding uh, the um, control of enzymes is uh, something that relates to basically enzyme helpers. Okay? Enzyme helpers. It's kind of like hamburger helper for enzymes, right? Except for, I'm not sure how good it tastes. Hamburger helper doesn't taste that good either, so it may, may, be, it may be a wash. I don't know. Okay? Now, Enzyme helpers. What do I mean by enzyme helpers? We, we refer to them as coenzymes. And coenzymes are, I'm going to give you a definition here, non-amino acid molecules that help an enzyme to function. So they're non-amino acid molecules that help an enzyme to function. Now, why do enzymes have non-amino acid molecules? Well, it turns out that many times the non-amino acid molecules have chemical properties that the enzyme needs in its catalytic function. And regular amino acids don't have those capabilities. Okay? Prime example, the very first one you see up there is called biotin. In fact, virtually all the coenzymes you see up here are vitamins. All right? Many, many coenzymes are vitamins, meaning they're needed in trace amounts, they're necessary for biological reactions, and the reason that they're necessary is because they act as coenzymes for enzymes. Okay, now, as I said, some of them have, in fact, virtually all of them have chemical properties that regular amino acids don't have, and so these molecules are used by enzymes to perform functions. Biotin, as I noted, is a very important one because biotin um, has a very useful property. It carries uh, um, carbon dioxide. It will carry a carbon dioxide. So for cells that need to put a carboxyl group onto something, and we'll see some examples of this later in the term, when enzymes need to put a carboxyl group onto something, they will almost always use biotin. They will almost always have biotin in them. And the way that you can tell is if an enzyme has the name carboxylase in it, it will almost always have biotin. Okay? We'll see that the ability to carry carbon dioxide by biotin is very important, for example, in the synthesis of glucose. Very important in the synthesis of glucose. There are many other places that we'll talk about where that, that is an important consideration. Coenzyme A has a very useful property is it's really good at holding on to fatty acid groups. It's really good at holding on to fatty acid groups. Okay? Flavin coenzymes, as we shall see, play very important roles in oxidation and reduction. Oxidation generally yields energy in the cell. Reduction generally uses energy or needs energy in the cell. Okay? And we'll see that oxidation reduction reactions are some of the most important reactions in biochemistry because they produce the energy that we use by oxidation. And they use that energy in reduction to make things like proteins and other things, carbohydrates and so forth in our bodies. And we'll talk more about those as well. You can see the various vitamin precursors listed over here on the right side. And I'm not asking you to necessarily memorize this table, but I think the ones that I have mentioned here are things that you should know the function of. Okay. One of these coenzymes is known as NAD. Okay? And I'm sure you've, you've heard about NAD and NADH in your basic biology and cellular molecular biology classes. NAD is, uh, as are the flavin coenzymes, involved in oxidation reduction reactions. 
And both of these classes of coenzymes, the flavins and the, the, the uh, NAD uh, coenzymes, both of these classes of coenzymes have a virtually unique property. And the virtually unique property they have is that they can carry or donate electrons. They can carry and they can donate electrons. All right? When we have oxidation occurring in the cell, it's not like oxidation that occurs out in the real world. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, if I take an oxidation out in the real world, I light a match, I can see the flame of the match, I can see oxidation occurring. There's no electron carriers, and I also note that that match is getting pretty darn hot. Right? So if I had the same kind of uncontrolled oxidation going on inside of my cells, my cells would burn up. So cells go through oxidation in a controlled process. And that control is exerted by having oxidations, first of all, regulated by enzymes. And second of all, occurring in small energetic steps. Those small energetic steps keep the cell from getting too hot. And we'll see in some cases that cells can definitely warm up with the oxidation that they're occurring. But they're not getting anything like a match is, is going. And the other thing that the enzyme carriers do is by carrying the enzyme, I'm sorry, by carrying the electrons, what the electron carrying coenzymes do is they prevent the cell from making very, very reactive molecules that cause damage. Okay? So electrons on the loose are a problem. A prime example of electrons on the loose are cells can make something called superoxide. Superoxide is an oxygen that gains an extra electron. It's one of the most reactive things that can occur inside of your cells. And the problem with that is that it will react with the first thing it bumps into. That's a real problem. Imagine it bumps into your DNA first. Imagine it bumps into your protein first. Imagine it bumps into something that you need in the cell first. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to chemically react with it and change it. It's going to be a problem. So cells have a lot of different things inside of them to prevent those electrons from just going willy-nilly and creating reactive oxygen species. And we'll talk more about that. NAD is a carrier of electrons. Yeah. So you said when they carry electrons, it prevents the cell from making something. OK. So when they carry the electrons, they prevent the electrons from creating reactive molecules, which can, in, which can include reactive oxygen species. And there's many others. OK? OK. And this shows what happens with the electron carrying part of NAD. I'm not going to ask you the structure, so don't worry about that. All right? But it shows, first of all, that this molecule or this portion of the molecule can exist in two forms. It can exist in a form called NAD+, which is the oxidized form. And it can exist in the form called NADH, which is the reduced form. The reduced form has already gained the electrons. The oxidized form does not have the electrons. Okay, we'll say more about reduction and oxidation later. Okay? But NAD is oxidized, NADH is the reduced form. Okay? This guy here, uh, pyridoxal, is an important uh, uh, enzyme that uh, we will talk about later as it relates to oxidation also, although it doesn't carry electrons, it does participate in a very important oxidation reaction that occurs in the citric acid cycle that we'll, we'll discuss later. Okay? And another thing that this enzyme can do is a very important uh, set of reactions that are important for um, nutrition. Okay? And the reason it's important is this enzyme I'm sorry, this coenzyme is, is an important part of an enzyme known as transaminase. Transaminase. Okay? I'll tell you why it's important for nutrition in a second. But the enzyme that it's a part of, or one of the enzymes it's a part of, is called transaminase. No, I'm sorry, we're talking about pyridoxal phosphate. Yeah, sorry. 
That wasn't a very good transition, was it? No. Okay. So we've got pyridoxal phosphate. It's a coenzyme. It's a part of transaminase. Now, <clears throat> what this reaction, what this coenzyme does, it's a great exchanger, a really good exchanger. And in the reaction that you see on the screen, we have an exchange going on. On the left side, we have an amino acid known as glutamate, and we have a non-amino acid known as pyruvate. Pyruvate is produced by the breakdown of glucose. We'll learn, we'll learn that later. Okay? What's happening in this reaction is the amine and the oxygen are swapping places. You'll notice over here, this alpha ketoglutarate is just the glutamate that has the oxygen, and the alanine is the pyruvate that has the amine. So what's happened in this reaction is something has enabled these two guys to swap, and the something that enabled that was pyridoxal phosphate. Okay. Now there's an elaborate enzyme reaction. I'm not going to go through. I'm going to spare you that, so you don't need to worry about it. But it's a very cool process in which the enzyme goes through what's called a ping-pong mechanism. The enzyme goes through two different states. We won't talk about it other than that I'll just mention it. It's a ping-pong mechanism. Okay? If you like ping-pong and I love ping-pong, I'll tell you about the enzyme. Okay. So now it's important for nutrition because when we think about nutrition, we think first of all amino acids are important. And second of all, the movement of nitrogen in our body is very important. Okay? Very, we don't think about it a lot. But in fact, our body has to balance nitrogen. We have to have the right amount. And once we have the right amount, we have to move it. We have to share it between molecules. And what you see in this process is the movement of nitrogen from one molecule to another. This is a very, very important step in the process, that are, in a very important process of nitrogen balance in our body. We'll talk more about that later also. Okay, so that finishes up what I want to say about control. I want to spend a little bit of time now. Are there questions about that before I go forward? Everybody's ready to go outside, right? Okay, well, let's talk about biological membranes. It's a bit of a change. We start talking at this point about structure and function. Not structure and function of enzymes, but now structure and function inside of molecules inside of cells. Okay? So the structure and function we've talked about so far are great big things like proteins. We're now going to talk about structures inside of cells, molecules inside of cells, like um, uh, biological, uh, small biological molecules. Fatty acids is a good place to start. Okay? We hear a lot about fatty acids. Fatty acids are what gives me what I have here. Okay? Fatty acids are components of fat. Okay? And fatty acids, I hope you remember from your organic chemistry, occur in a couple different forms. All right? The common features that they have is that they have a carboxyl at one end. So there's the carboxyl. The other end is a long, nonpolar tail. And the character of that long, nonpolar tail can vary from one amino acid to the next. I'm falling over here. Okay. One, it can vary in length. Two, it can vary in unsaturation. Okay, so unsaturation, of course, refers to double bonds. A fatty acid that has no double bonds is called a saturated fatty acid. A, saturated, a fatty acid that has at least one double bond is called an unsaturated fatty acid. And a fatty acid that has more than one double bond is called a polyunsaturated fatty acid. You've heard about all these terms, I'm sure. The double bonds, as you can see on the screen, cause there to be some different character to these fatty acids. Going back to your organic chemistry, you remember again that single bonds have complete freedom of rotation. Double bonds do not. And because we have no freedom of rotation, we essentially have kinks wherever we have a double bond. I also note that fatty acids, the double bonds that occur in nature, that is biologically made fatty acids, almost always have a cis bond, not a trans bond. The bond 
in naturally made fatty acids is almost always cis. There are a few exceptions to that, but almost always they're in the cis configuration. Okay. Now we'll talk more about that later when we talk about trans fats, and I'm sure you've heard about trans fats and you know something about trans fats, but that's where that term comes from. A trans fat is a fat that contains fatty acids that contains trans double bonds. Okay? That's what a trans fat refers to. Okay? Trans fats are made by chemical processes used in the food industry. They're not made in a natural uh, system to any significant extent. Okay? Now, when we think about the chemical characteristics of these, I've described them too. First of all, we have a, a polar end where there's a carboxyl, and we have a nonpolar tail out here. There are two features in that nonpolar tail that will determine the chemical characteristics of that fatty acid to start with. And by the way, the chemical characteristics of the fatty acid will be shared by the fat that contains it. Okay? Well, what are those characteristics? Right? They are as follows. The longer the chain, okay, the longer the chain, the higher the melting point. It takes more energy to melt it. The more I'm sorry, the more saturated the chain, the higher the melting point. Okay. So the more saturated it is, the higher the melting point. The longer it is, the higher the melting point. All right. That means conversely that the shorter the chain is, the lower the melting point, and the more unsaturated it is, the lower the melting point. Okay? It's actually the amount of unsaturation that plays the biggest role here, and it's the unsaturation that determines whether or not we have an oil or a fat. Oils and fats have the same general composition, the difference being that an oil has more polyunsaturated fats and is a liquid at room temperature. A fat has more saturated fats, or saturated fatty acids, and is a solid at room temperature. We tend to associate more health issues associated with diets that are rich in saturated fats. These include atherosclerosis and other uh, uh, problems relating to cholesterol that we'll talk about later in the term. Okay. Yes? That should be an alpha-linolenic. You are correct. Good eyes. Very good eyes. Okay. That should be alpha-linolenic. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about those fatty acids on the bottom. They're kind of cool. All right. So you see the fatty acids on the bottom have more than one double bond. All right. And if we were to number them, starting with the carboxyl group, we would count as follows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right? Then we see a double bond. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right? And we see more. All right. So what am I telling you? This guy up here only has one double bond. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Again. All right. This guy right here, oleic acid, is one that human beings can make in their bodies. It's called a non-essential fatty acid because we can make it. Anything that has a double bond further than nine away from the carboxyl, we can't make. So this guy down here, linoleic, we can't make it because it has a nine, but it also has a 12. Make sense? Okay. So this linoleic and this linolenic, which is misspelled, this linolenic both of these are what we call essential fatty acids. We must have them in our diet because our body needs them and we can't make them. Essential fatty acids. Okay? Not, if it's more than nine after the carboxyl, then we can't make it. Right. Now, there's another designation that you hear with 
fatty acids called omega fatty acids, right? You've heard of omega-3s, omega-5s, and so forth. Omega counts from the other end. And you can't always subtract because the length of the fatty acid varies. So you have to go down here and say, one, two, three. There's an omega-3 fatty acid. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's an omega-6 fatty acid. Okay. So the omega counts from the other end of the carboxyl. The, 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 um, uh, this one's called a delta, by the way. I didn't give you that name. Counting from the carboxyl down is, is a delta. So a delta 9 would mean that we've got something that's got a double bond 9 down from the carboxyl. OK. Now, I wanted to tell you a brief story about these fatty acids and how they relate to um, our health and our nutrition. All right. If we think about the chemical properties of these, based on what I've told you, I said that oils contain more polyunsaturated fats, fatty acids than do fats. That's why they're a liquid at room temperature and not a solid. When we look at the composition of membranes, what we're going to see is that membranes contain fatty acids as well. Okay? And one of the really bad things for a membrane is for it to solidify. We want a membrane to be fluid. When a membrane solidifies, it doesn't give the cell the mobility and the freedom that it needs. But if we look at evolutionary biology, we discover some really interesting things. Organisms tend to have membranes that have evolved according to the environment in which they find themselves. For example, fish. Fish swim out in the ocean. The ocean is not like it is, um, say, in the tropics. It is not, um, if you go to Antarctica, if you go to off the Oregon coast, that's fairly chilly water that those fish are in. When we compare the fatty acids in the membranes of fish with the membranes in the, of the fatty acids in the membranes of human beings, there's a big difference. The fish have many more polyunsaturated fatty acids in their membranes. That's why some people think that eating fish and fish oil is good for you because it's full of those polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the reason that those polyunsaturated fatty acids are there is so that their membrane stays fluid. Okay? We don't have that issue because, or I shouldn't say we don't have that issue, we don't have membranes like that because we're in a relatively warmer environment than those organisms are at because our body temperature is kept pretty much at 98.6 all the time, and we're not swimming in something that's surrounding us with cold air and cold water. Okay. All right. Saturated fatty acids. All right. This is simply just to show you a, a, an illustration. The only one on here I think that's really important to know is palmitic. I think palmitic is important because it's the most common fatty acid that we have. As we will see, it's the primary one that our body makes. It has 16 carbons. It has no double bonds. And you'll notice that all of these guys have no double bonds. No double bonds in AM. These are all saturated fatty acids. They vary only in length. And as the length gets longer, what happens to the melting point? Well, as I said, it goes up. So the longer the chain, the higher the melting point. Here's a table of unsaturated fatty acids, OK? Here are, and it's interesting to compare these three right here. They all have the same number of carbons. Oleic has one double bond. Linoleic has two double bonds. There's that delta again. And linolenic has three double bonds. Look what happens to their melting point. It goes from 16 degrees centigrade to minus 5 centigrade to minus 11. Increasing the number of double bonds lowers the melting temperature. OK. Now, fats are also known as triisoglycerols. And that's a term I will use and assume that you know what it means when I say it. Okay? The name tells you what its structure is. Triacyl. An acyl group refers to a fatty acid. So triacyl means three fatty acids. Triacylglycerol. Glycerol is what the fatty acids are attached to. 
Okay, so there's glycerol. There is a triacoglycerol. This one's a specific one, but I just use the general term triacoglycerol. We see that they've been joined to the um, uh, glycerol in ester bonds. So these are ester bonds that join this together. And this guy is a fat. And fats are very water insoluble. There's nothing up here that's very water soluble, that, that's, that's very hydrophilic. There's nothing down here that's very hydrophilic. And these guys really don't like water. That's why when you shake vinegar with oil, they separate because, of course, there's the oil is all, the un, is all of the uh, nonpolar triacoglycerols. This illustrates that the three fatty acids can be the same or the three fatty acids can be different. In fact, most of the time we find that they're different. How do we break down a fat? Well, we have enzymes called lipases, L-I-P-A-S-E-S, -E that catalyze the reaction that you can see on the screen. Here's a fat. Okay, It's now been turned on its side instead of turning facing down like it was before. There's the glycerol backbone right there. We see enzyme breaking it down. These are lipases. And they break it down into fatty acid, fatty acid, fatty acid, and glycerol. So the products of breaking down a fat are three fatty acids and a glycerol. There are other ways of breaking down fat chemically. The most common one are, is called saponification. It's the way that they make soap. And in soap, you're treating a fat with sodium hydroxide. That causes the bonds to break chemically. You get the same things now, except for you also notice that you got this sodium guy here. And the sodium combined with that, that's what makes up a soap. Polar and nonpolar and. Polar and nonpolar and. Okay? So that's how soaps are made or by saponification. Okay. Now, I turn our attention now to a related molecule called phosphatidic acid. Okay? Phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid turns out to be very important for us because, as we will discover later, it's what we can describe as a branch molecule, meaning it's, it's at the, the, the branch point for two different metabolic pathways. Okay? We'll talk about those later. But for the moment, let's consider the structure of phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid is related to fat. It's related because there's a glycerol backbone there, there, and there. The three carbons of the glycerol backbone are there. Two of the carbons are linked to fatty acids, just like in fat. But one of the fatty acids has been replaced by a phosphate. That's what makes phosphatidic acid. And the reason I bring this up is we will see that this general structure is used to make membranes. So phosphatidic acid is a starting point for making molecules that function in membranes. Okay. Well, how does that occur? It occurs by this guy right here, this phosphate, getting something attached to it. That's what the R group there is. Okay? That's what the R group there is. What the R group is can be a variety of things. I'll give you a couple of examples. Okay? I might put an amino acid serine on there. So if I were to attach a serine here where the R is, that is, if R is a serine, this guy would be called phosphatidyl serine. If I put uh, an ethanolamine there, I would call it phosphatidyl ethanolamine. If I put a Kevin Ahern there, I would call it phosphatidyl Kevin Ahern. All right? So the phosphatidyl is the entire rest of it, and then we name it according to what the R is. So phosphatidyl serine or whatever. Now, why is this important? Well, it turns out that if we look we can actually see the importance here and to a lesser extent here. Look at the structure of this guy. Okay? This is a little bit like the structure we had of a soap. A soap had a negative charge or a, 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 at one end, and it had a, a, um, um, a neutral charge at the other end. Right? So we made micelles and so forth to dissolve uh, grease. If we look at this guy here, these guys are very nonpolar. It's long tail sticking off here. Long tail sticking off here. Polar. 
We call this the head, and we call these guys the tails. But instead of making a micelle, molecules that have this structure make what's called a bilayer. It's a very different structure than a micelle. It's actually what makes up a biological membrane, a bilayer. Okay. Now the bilayer arranges itself. I'll show you a, a structure in a second. But the bilayer arranges itself so that the nonpolar tails can associate with each other, and the polar heads can associate with water. Here's a variety of phosphatidyl compounds. So here's phosphatidylcholine. There's that structure you saw before. Now it's pointing the other way. Long tail, long tail. There's the glycerol backbone. That's the phosphatidyl part in purple. Here's the phosphate. Here is choline. All right. Glycerol lipids with other head groups. Here's phosphatidyl ethanolamine. There's the designation of that thing up here. Phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Phosphatidyl serine. Phosphatidyl glycerol. Diphosphatidyl glycerol. We don't worry about that one. This guy actually is interesting because it, it, it appears primarily in heart, which is why it's called cardiolipin, right? and phosphatidylinositol. I'm not going to ask you to draw these structures, so don't worry about that. But if I say phosphatidyl something, I think that you should be able to picture in your head that general structure of what I'm talking about. OK. Now, there's another class of molecules that are found in membranes of cells that are very important. And these, at first glance, look like they're very different from the glycerol phospholipids, but they're not quite as different as you might think. Okay? They're called sphingolipids, S-P-H-I-N-G-O-L-I-P-I-D-S. Okay? Sphingolipids. Yes, S P I. I'm sorry, S-P-H-I-N-G-O-L-I-P-I-D, sphingolipid. Okay? Now, this is a class of molecules that are based on a molecule called sphingosine. Okay? Sphingosine looks like a long, big, hairy molecule. There's a long, nonpolar tail. But if we look at it kind of closely, we see, at first glance, it resembles a glycerophospholipid. What does a glycerophospholipid has? It has a long nonpolar tail. It has a carbon with an oxygen from glycerol. It has a carbon with an oxygen from glycerol. Look at this, bang, bang, bang. It looks kind of like a glycerol there, doesn't it? Okay. Well, if we start attaching various things to that, like we attach something here to it, we make something that doesn't look that different from a glycerophospholipid. Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw the structure of this, so don't worry about that. Okay? But I do want you to know that sphingolipids are related in the sense that they have similar chemical properties to the glycerophospholipids. Okay? I'm going to mention a couple of them because they're important. Okay? One of them you see right here. Most sphingolipids and you might want to make note of this, most sphingolipids do not contain phosphate. That's one way they differ from the glycerophospholipids. Most of them do not. Here is a rare exception, and it's a very important one, because sphingomyelin is what makes up the sheath of nerve cells. It's very, very predominantly found in the sheath of nerve cells. It's one of the few sphingolipids that contains a phosphate. Most of them do not contain a phosphate. Now, I'm sorry? It's called sphingomyelin. Okay. Now, sphingolipids generally vary in what's attached right here. In this case, they've got a phosphate attached, okay, and then this long molecule. Most sphingolipids have something else besides a phosphate and this attached. And this is another place where they differ from the glycerophospholipids. Most sphingolipids contain a sugar, at least one. Most sphingolipids contain at least one sugar right there on this bottom carbon. Okay. If they contain only one sugar at that point, we call them a cerebroside. 
C-E-R-E, -E, everybody's looking at me, like, are you going to spell that Ahern? C-E-R-E-B-R-O-S-I-D-E. -E -E. It sounds like cerebral, like it's in your head, and it is. So sphingolipids are very commonly found in nerve cells. We saw sphingomyelin. Now we see cerebrocytes. They're very common in your brain. And I said if it had a single carbon, I'm sorry, a single sugar, we called it a cerebroside. If it contains a complex set of, of sugars, and we'll see some later on, we call it a gangliocide. G-A-N-G-L-I-O-S-I-D-E. Gangliocide. Okay? And gangliocides are sometimes very odd-looking molecules. And like the cerebrocytes, we oftentimes find them in brain tissue. Very, very commonly found in brain tissue. Okay. Here's a cerebrocyte. There's that carbon, carbon, carbon. And we see now the attachment of a single sugar. You don't have to worry about the glucose cerebrocyte. We'll just call it a cerebrocyte. And here is a gangliocyte. Whoa. That's a little hard to recognize, right? Okay, so those three carbons that you saw before are there, there, and there, and now here's this monstrosity that's been attached to it. Okay, you can imagine this is going to give this guy some interesting chemical properties, and it does. And it turns out that gangliosides, the breakdown of gangliosides, I'm just telling you this, you don't need to know this, but the breakdown of gangliosides is a factor in some genetic diseases that lead to, to retardation. So these guys, their metabolism, the way in which they're broken down and the way in which they're made are very, very important. And when we start messing with nerve cells, we can imagine we're going to have some severe problems. That's one of the things that happens when gangliocyte metabolism does not occur properly. Okay? Questions about that? That's a lot of material today on a very sunny day. I think I should let you go home. Those are genetic diseases. Autism, the, the, the cause, not really known. But it's, no, it's, it's not. But the leading idea is that they're using the mercury liquid to suspend multiple... I understand. But that, that's baloney. That's complete baloney. That's right. Okay. It's awesome. But, but uh, it's, the, the, the cause is, is not gangliocytes. No. How often... I mean, is, is that a...